Philippe. Hello. I was about to sit on the horse thinking it was a chair. Um, so, uh, thank you for the intro. Uh, I want to talk to you guys about something a little bit different than most people when they talk about growth. Most people when they talk about growth, they talk about success, success cases. They talk about the amazing things that they've done from scaling from zero to a million and et cetera and blah, blah, blah. But um, one of the things that I've learned throughout my career is that when something can go wrong, usually it does. And it usually goes, it's usually like a perfect storm of things. So it's at the worst possible moment with the, when, I don't know, when the CTO is on vacation and the customer experience people are out of the office, there's no one to answer tickets, like things will just go crazy. And uh, that's usually when things go wrong. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about how you deal with these drastic changes, scaling, how things break down and how you kind of get unexpected uh, problems. So my slides are very simple because I'm going to do more talking. But um, So first I want to talk about just what Highbooks is. Highbooks is an audiobook app. Um, we basically wanted to create something very different, create a new model. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into it. You guys can go check it out. Um, but um, the idea was that we didn't want to just do something that already existed in the market. We really wanted to consolidate a few different things. When you guys see the app, you'll kind of, I think you'll get what I mean. Um, but in our mission to really drive, uh, entertain people, empower people, and educate people, we always had these very ambitious goals and ambitious plans. So the first thing is when I was thinking about growth for Highbooks, uh, I actually joined the company before it was called Highbooks. It wasn't called Highbooks, it was called Auto Radio. It was a podcast app, had nothing to do with books. Uh, we had just raised a significant round of investment and we were expanding the team and that's when I was hired. This was about two years ago. And what happened was there was pressure from the investors that they needed to monetize, monetize podcasts. And there was a lot of discussions around this about how to do it, if we should charge a uh, subscription, if we should um, think of ways, kind of like how Spotify is doing it or how different companies are doing it. There's a lot of discussions around this. But the founder and I, uh, we, well, he had this vision that he actually loved audiobooks and he loved how people were always constantly carrying, uh, uh, they could carry a book with them and things like that. And that was the thing that kind of really sparked his interest where he wanted to really launch something that was audio powered. It wasn't necessarily around podcasts, it was just about the audio journey. So we started looking at audiobooks as the big thing that could be a change. So right when I joined the company, uh, that was one of the biggest changes we made, which was actually completely pivoting the product from podcasts to audiobooks. Uh, the idea initially was to create both of them housed in the same app, and they would be both alive and well and things like that. But we realized that the people who listen to podcasts were very different than the people who listen to audiobooks. It seems like they're the same kind of people. It would seem like they're people who like audio thing, uh, audio content and like to just have content on the go with them. But in reality, they were very different, different types of content, different types of consumption. And we realized that we really couldn't fit these two audiences in the same place. So then we had to make a very tough decision, which was to kill podcasts in our app. That decision hurt a lot of people in the company because a lot of people were thinking like, hey, I love podcasts. This is what we're building. This is amazing. Why do we need to change to something just because it's going to make us more money? And that question had the answer in it. But um, it was kind of this idea where what was the vision of how you could grow and not just be stuck with something that was, you were constantly trying to fight for a bottom line because at the end of the day, investors will want to see success and, monetize, and monetization strategies and things like that. So when we started doing our projections, that's when I kind of realized that, um, well, you can put anything on a spreadsheet, right? If you open up Excel, you can put whatever you want. So you can put whatever conversion rate you think it'll be. You can put any uh, progress number month over month and growth month over month you want. And then at the end of the spreadsheet, you'll be like, yes, we're going to be a billionaire by 14 months. And it's very easy to do that. It's not hard at all. But um, what happens is when you start building these, these things out, you really want to try to plan and have these projections to something that's very, very uh, ambitious, but at the same time, you need to figure out how you're going to attack these things and how you're actually going to get there. 
So when you start building out your projections, the first thing that I can uh, say is 100%, doesn't matter how smart you are, it's gonna be wrong. 100% of your projections are gonna be wrong because it's impossible to think of every possible scenario. But you need to try to be uh, as close to the money as possible. So that's the, the first thing. What I did is I looked at different benchmarks. So I went on, talked to a bunch of people, had conversations with several different founders from industries that were similar, tried to get as many benchmarks as possible, just to really try to understand what would work. And this was before we were launching the app. When we launched the app, things made it well, things were much easier. Then it's just about iteration and testing, A-B testing, et cetera. But when you talk about planning, that's when it's hard. So a lot of people here who raise their hands that they're building a startup, um, how many are in this phase where they're actually trying to project their growth for the next 12 months? And have you guys just started this or were you already doing this for a while? If you've just started this, anyone who's just started this, um, how ambitious is your projection for 12 months? Pretty ambitious. And people who kind of have already like midway through, have you hit the numbers that you've been projecting? That's normal. It's not, it shouldn't be scary, that's normal. So when you don't hit those numbers, the first thing you need to think about is iteration and uh, adapting. So one of the things that I like to think about is when you talk about growth, it's all about optimization. It doesn't matter if you're right or if you're wrong. You can always improve. So always think about optimization. The way that you instill a growth mindset in the company, in your team, is to always think about <coughs> failures lead to better things, and even success leads to better things. So you need to really think about optimization. Doesn't matter how right or wrong you got. Um, I'm gonna share an example with, uh, with you guys from the best hack that we did at Highbooks. We launched our conversion flow, and things looked okay. I had projected that we would have a 6% purchase conversion rate from sign up to purchase. And we were at 5.2. And I was like, okay, not that bad. That's pretty accurate. I was actually closer than I expected to be. I was thinking I was gonna be like at three. Um, but then one of my product engineers, he came over to me and he said, what if we change the flow to something that's terrible for customer experience but might be good for us? And it's something that I had done in a previous company which was just put a hard paywall without letting them see anything. Don't let the customer see anything. Just ask them for money, ask them for their credit card before they even see the product. It's very counterintuitive, right? I mean, you think no one's gonna give you their money or give you their credit card information before looking at your app. Okay. And I was like, all right, A-B test it, let's do it. We launched it, we went to 13%. So our, we basically doubled our growth or our purchase conversion rate by simply doing this tiny little hack where instead of diving right into the app, they saw a purchase flow. Now, this created a problem for customer experience because then a lot of our customers were coming to us like, hey, I wasn't expecting to have to give my credit card information, et cetera, and they were very angry about this. But at the same time, once they got into the product and realized that it was good and they really liked it, then they were kind of less upset about it. So there is a balance. You don't need to go like overboard and, and just kind of overkill it. But then this is just one little tiny hack that we did that we realized, okay, I'm sure that we can optimize on these flows and get numbers and, that are good or bad, et cetera. Uh, one thing that's really important to remember is sometimes your purchase conversion rate may go up, but then your churn goes up because people are buying without knowing what they're buying. So just keep that in mind. So uh, milestones. One thing that I think is really important for any founder or any company when they're talking about growth is actually having legitimate milestones. I don't know if you guys work with OKRs. Who works with OKRs? Okay, so OKRs, objective key results. Uh, you create an objective and then you have like key results that show you that you met that objective. If you have a right objective, if you created it correctly or if you thought about it correctly, you'll never reach it. They should be very, very ambitious you'll get to maybe 70%, 65%, 75% of your OKR. That means you were successful. If you get to 100, be more ambitious next quarter. But um, when you plan these milestones, celebrate them. That's one thing that is a big growing pain. Sometimes you're always so focused on not growing fast enough or growing but 
still so much to do, et cetera, that you don't celebrate these milestones. What we did is we started drinking uh, a bottle of champagne for every thousand customers we got. And then this scaled way too fast. And then we couldn't keep doing that. Um, so the first couple of months, we were like, yay, six bottles, seven bottles, 12 bottles, yay. And then we got to the point where we had like four bottles per employee and that wasn't working. And so we had to cut that down and change it. We did a party instead of uh, champagne bottles. But find your way to celebrate your milestones. It'll get there and this is the thing. You, you're gonna adapt on these things too. It's good for, uh, even if you're not exactly at the numbers you want it to be, it's good to celebrate the milestones because it feels like a win and wins are important. Um, tools. How many of you don't think you're growing because you don't have the tools at your disposal? Okay, three. Three people raise their hands. So everyone here thinks they have all the tools they need to be able to grow. Okay, good. Then that can't be a complaint because that's the number one complaint I get from people. Whenever I talk to any marketer, it's, I don't have the right tracking. I don't have the right uh, backend infrastructure. I don't have data scientists. I don't have... Uh, I don't know, uh, dashboards that show me every little thing. Um, so if you guys do that already, great. Um, but most of the time, people don't have the tools that they need at their disposal or don't have all the tools that they need. If you go into uh, different companies, they'll have different tools from tracking to dashboards to everything else. Every company has their own setup. What's important to remember is at the end of the day, you need to look at the underlying numbers that you can actually be certain are correct. Right? So in the beginning, the first few months, I think the first six months, uh, dashboards weren't a priority. So I was working with a lot of Excel spreadsheets to determine the blended cost of acquisition between organic and paid. And that's it. So we were doing this amazing growth and growing to uh, hundreds of thousands of, of users and I still didn't have a dashboard to look at and say, oh, okay, Facebook is my best channel. Uh, like that was the kind of problem that I was facing. What I realized is I could get this information from different places and just kind of build my own internal dashboard, but do it through Excel, et cetera. I think the most important thing is when you're going through these growing pains, you're never gonna have the perfect tool. It's never gonna be the perfect CRM tool. It's never gonna be the perfect, um, dashboard, it's never going to be the perfect tracking tool. It's always going to be a little bit below what you need it to be, and that's actually comfortable. That's good because it keeps you moving forward. Um, if anyone here, for, who's heard of Braze? I know you've heard of Braze. Who's heard of Braze? Okay, Braze is a CRM tool that's an amazing tool. It's also super expensive. And for young startups, it's way more expensive than they can afford 90% of the time. But it's probably the best tool in the market. So then there's always these discussions with people that I meet is, should I go and get Braze or not? My answer is always, did you test anything for, without this tool to show you that there's data that supports that getting this tool will drive even more growth? Or is it just because it's hype and all the big startups are doing it? Like that's the thing that you always need to keep in your mind is find the right tool for you, find the right thing for your company, for your size, so you can continue to scale and eventually get there. Don't, you don't need to like over, you add too many weapons to your pack. Cool. Things you can't plan. How many of you have an app or a system or anything like that that just simply had a big crash and had a crash that you were left maybe an entire day or two days offline? Okay. Usually when something like this big happens, you can plan for this. If you could plan for this, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, you can try to plan and try to mitigate bugs as much as possible, but it's not the kind of thing that, ha that, that is easy to track. So for example, when you're growing very, very fast, we had this issue with our server, is our backend, when we first initially built it, um, we had, I think it was something like an auto renewal for two years on AWS, and then the third year you had to opt in to auto renew and no one knew about this. And all of a sudden we hit our third year when we had our best month ever. And we just had an amazing scale, everything was looking perfect, and all of a sudden, crash. The app isn't working, no one's listening to their books. We got 3,000 tickets in six hours. Most of our users are in the United States. 
Our team is in Germany, so this happened when all of our customer experience team was asleep. Uh, so I was answering tickets at three in the morning and our customer experience team woke up and they were answering tickets as well, trying to calm people down, which was amazing to see our team actually rally behind this cause of trying to like, okay, let's calm people down. But none of us knew the problem. We didn't, knew what, we didn't know what happened. So we were answering tickets and telling them to, no, it'll be back in a second, when we had no idea what was going on. Then our engineers woke up. This is what I meant by the perfect storm. Our CTO was on vacation. Our uh, back-end engineer was in, a f was in a plane crossing the country, crossing the United States. So he was going from New York to LA. Our, product, or our customer experience team were asleep. Our mobile engineers were in Germany asleep. Um, our data scientists uh, were, one of them was on the plane with the engineer. The other one was in San Francisco, but he had never touched anything. He was one week in the company. He didn't even know what was going on. So it was the perfect storm. Like no one that could answer our questions was available to answer the questions. And the, the CTO who was on vacation, it's not like he was on vacation and didn't want to answer. He was on vacation somewhere with no cell signal. Like we couldn't even get a hold of him. We had no idea where he was. So we're trying to answer the customers like, hey, it, it'll be back in a second. And I'm calling my CEO like, what the hell just happened? Give me something. And we, I was already predicting the worst. I thought like, okay, all the users are gonna leave us because eventually, effectively what users say is, of these 3,000 tickets, all of them were, I hate you guys, you guys ruined my life. I'm getting on a plane now and don't have the books. I'm like, jeez, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to. But um, that's kind of how it feels and then sometimes you just piled on these things. What happens is you can't plan for these things. So what you need to do is you need to really be careful of how you answer the tickets. Again, it was three in the morning, right? So I was answering a ticket and one of the customers, I didn't know who it was, it was just a user, a customer, said something like, um, you guys are awful. I, uh, I really expected more from you. And I was kind of like up to here. I didn't really reply the best way and I said something along the lines of like, uh, sorry you feel that way. If you want to cancel, I understand. It's fine. Okay. Like, it's life. It turns out this guy was a big influencer. And he tweeted like, these guys suck. This is his answer to me when I said his product was off. And it like generated like a bigger shitstorm. And then I was like, Jesus, like, I can't catch a break. And that's the kind of feeling that sometimes happens when you're scaling very fast without the infrastructure in place. Off that, one of the things that we learned is never, ever, ever not know when your server's gonna go off. Like, that's obvious. But um, we started creating different rules. Like, for example, no releases on Friday. We don't do any product releases on Friday. Pretty obvious, because if something happens, weekend is ruined for everyone, plus our customers are even more upset because they use the product more on the weekend and things like that. So we, we started creating these rules to try to mitigate these potential problems, but you can't plan everything. So you can try, but um, I don't actually think it's worth the effort. I think sometimes it's okay to discover what the problem is as you go through it. Cool, and uh, who here has um, had issues with all right, who believes that they are in a company that is very transparent? <laughs> wow. <laughs> are you guys even in startups? <laughs> all right, who believes that their company could be more transparent? Okay, okay. So uh, there's always been this dilemma with transparency and oversharing uh, for me. I'm extremely transparent. I tell my team everything that's going on. As soon as I have information, I tell them everything that's happening. I believe transparency is key to making sure that people are motivated and, they're also, and they also trust you. However, sometimes uh, when we share things with customers, it can be a problem. We did this big shift in our product, which was uh, we had, um, Initially when we launched, we were a Netflix of audiobooks. It was 10 bucks a month, you could listen to as many books as you wanted and just go crazy. When you create a buffet, you're essentially inviting heavy eaters. That's what we kind of hoped didn't happen. Um, we kind of hoped that 
we could create a platform where the 97% of people who are normal listeners were subsidizing that 3% of heavy eaters. What it turns out is that people started not, over, not only listening like crazy, but like sharing their accounts and uh, doing these crazy things where we had one user that listened to, I think it was um, 190 audiobooks in a month. Each book has an average of nine hours. That doesn't add up. Like, it's something happened there, but um, he, he was probably sharing his account. But um, So there were things that we could have done to mitigate this, but then we started realizing that this was a problem. And we were never gonna be able to offer the product that we wanted having this kind of model. So we went back, sat down with the publishers, sat down with everybody. We wanted to expand our library, but at this level, it was, made it very difficult. With this offering, made it very difficult. So we sat back with the publishers, we talked to them about how can we develop a new model, something different than Audible has, which is 15 bucks and one credit, and something different than a few other companies like us or Script had that was unlimited, but a very limited catalog. Uh, catalog. So how do we kind of like combine the best of both worlds? And we were talking to them about this, et cetera, and then we're like, okay, cool, let's talk to our customers and share with them what's happening. And we started talking to some of our customers about this and explaining to them the reasons behind why we were making some of the decisions we were making. And then we started seeing threads in Reddit about people fighting and complaining to each other like, it's because of you that I'm gonna have to pay more now. And having like these big discussions and threads about how this was a problem. That there were people who were abusing the system and it was bad for everyone. And it became political discussions and all these things. And then inside the company, we were like, okay, should we tell everyone? Should every employee know every decision that we're making and the reasons behind these decisions? Uh, that's something that, in my opinion, um, yes, you should. But it really comes down to you and your team and your company and how it works. I believe that uh, everyone has a right to know, but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they need to know every single detail. So this issue with transparency and oversharing, it creates a lot of problems, so I think you really need to pick how you share the information you're sharing. Um, because one thing is very certain, doesn't matter what product you have, doesn't matter what company you're in or what company you are, you're not gonna make everyone happy. You are gonna have unhappy users. Very, very, very often. Um, and I remember we had this one user who was very, uh, to me this is one of the most beautiful success stories that we have, one of the most beautiful user stories we have. Um, it's this uh, girl, this user, she is from the United States. She is bedridden because she has uh, lupus and she physically can't even lift a book anymore. She loves reading, she majored in literature or I think English literature and she loves reading, she loves books, but she can't even physically pick up a book anymore. She's just always constantly in bed and in hospitals. Uh, she also can't work, so she couldn't afford uh, Audible because she could only listen to one book a month and it was just too expensive. When she saw our product uh, and saw that it was much more affordable, it made much more sense for her, she, sent us this, she just sent us a message saying like, I'm very happy I found you guys, you guys made my life better. And that like touched everyone's hearts. That was amazing. It was this great story. Our social media manager had, uh, and she took it completely on her own. And I thought that was a great idea, where she uh, sent the user. She asked the user what her favorite author was, and then she said it was Jody Picot, who is uh, an author from the United States. We reached out to Jody Picot. Jody Picot signed a few books and signed a poster for her. We sent them to her. Uh, we sent her a speaker as well, so she can listen to it better than on her phone. And she was just extremely happy about it. None of this was marketing. None of this was the marketing team. It was just our social media person who engaged with this user, just decided to do it. Um, and that was, to me, like a huge win. It was one of our best stories. That same day, we got a note from a user saying how we completely ruined their life uh, because they now didn't have, because we had removed a book from a catalog, and we removed, I think it was one of Stephen King's books, I don't remember which one, and he was saying how we ruined his life that he has to go back to Audible because we don't have that book anymore. So it was like, on the same day, we got this amazing, beautiful, inspiring story, and we also got this guy saying like, you guys suck, and you're not gonna make everyone happy. So you need to try to tailor your product, tailor your growth, towards the people that you can effectively scale, but also the people that are really gonna enjoy your product and they're gonna 
be happy using it. Don't try to cater to that 5% that get pissed off, those edge cases. That's the mistake that I think most people make, is that they see one user who is extremely angry, and they try to cater towards that and fix that user's, all, those user, all the problems that that user is facing. Uh, I understand, and I understand that mindset because you wanna make sure that everyone's happy, but it's just f not possible. So think about that when you're scaling. The more people you attract, the more unhappy users you also end up attracting. So you need to be able to tune that out. And, uh, and to me, I think the biggest issue when dealing with uh, scale is changes that are made for you. For example, in our case, we license content from publishers, right? We have content from the best, the top publishers in the world. And if, for example, if a publisher decides that they don't want to offer a book anymore, we can't do anything about that. Um, uh, unless, well, technically we could. We could go directly to the author and buy the book rights from them and redevelop everything. But um, it, it, it's the kind of thing where it makes it very difficult, right? So when you have, it, who here has a product that they depend on external forces to be able to run their product? Okay, so in these situations, it's very important for you to remember that you need to plan ahead and plan and mitigate these issues. So if, for example, in our case, which is content, um, we never offered Harry Potter. It's audiobooks. And we never offered Harry Potter. Uh, does anyone have any guess as to why? There you go. It's extremely expensive. It, Scholastic, who owns Harry Potter, uh, and I think now it's a different one, but um, anyway, Harry Potter, their publisher, is an amazing publisher, and they have Harry Potter. They don't need to deal with anyone. Right, it's Harry Potter. So basically they control everything. They don't need to uh, uh, offer anything to you in the terms that you want. So for us, it was very important for us to say, okay, you know what? We'd rather create amazing deals with the publishers that are our partners that do amazing uh, programs with us and eventually we'll touch back on Harry Potter if it makes sense. Instead of offering it and then continuously like arguing about is it too expensive, is it problematic, etc. Because they at any moment could potentially pull it or X. So we took uh, upon ourselves that we're not going to offer it. And then this is the single most search query that we have in our app is Harry Potter. People come into the app, they just expect to find it. What we realized is that people aren't unhappy if they don't see it. They just expect to find it because they want to see if you have good books. So the first book that comes to people's mind is Harry Potter, search for Harry Potter. The second one, immediately, it's whatever book has just been made into a movie. And this we see constantly changing. So if, uh, when it was It, uh, It was the second biggest search for a long time, and then it became Ready Player One, and then it became whatever other big book was be turned into a big movie. So that's when we realized that um, when you're in a situation where changes can be made for you, you really need to plan around developing your product that mitigates these situations. That's the hardest thing. Um, but yeah, uh, that's what I have. Um, I don't know if you guys have questions, if we're gonna do questions after. After? Do them now. Do them now. Thank you, first of all, for the wonderful talk. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm intrigued by your discovery that um, by changing the workflow, from um, taking the credit card details at the end, switching it to taking the card details at the beginning, you were able to more than double your conversion rate. How do you explain that? So basically it's uh, when users came into the flow, the sign up flow in general, they were just, they literally had just started, right? So they saw an ad. So uh, have you ever heard of the, the psych points uh, methodology? So basically, we realize that when users just see an ad, just get to the app store, all that beautiful imagery, and then come into their first moment, that's when their psych point is at its highest. So for us, it made sense that if we asked for the credit card for them to go see the content, they're like, okay, fine. And it kind of felt like they just blazed through it. And we started asking users and they said, well, I kind of expected this because everywhere else, like um, if I go to Netflix, I can't see what's on Netflix without at least starting the free trial. But to start the free trial, I have to put my credit card information in. So we started realizing that it's not that um, different from other uh, industry standard products. 
Uh, so we tested it, but we didn't expect it would be that big of an uplift. Uh, it was really a surprise that it was that big of an uplift. One of the things that, things that we did test was the different duration of the trials. So for example, if we offered three day free trial, seven day free trial, 30 day free trial, these things uh, completely changed the numbers. So for us, um, we actually ran a test that I think was terrible user experience. Uh, the best conversion rate we ever got, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but the best one ever was when we did no free trial and asked for a credit card without seeing anything. It's completely counterintuitive. There is no logical thinking behind it. It's just like you're paying without even knowing what you're going to access. But it was the highest conversion rate we got. It was terrible user experience because their churn was insane because then everybody was just assuming that uh, once they got into the product, they could cancel at any point. And then that's the tickets that we got. And then they're like, oh, I didn't realize it wasn't a free trial. Cancel, give me my money back. Then we had problems with refunding, et cetera. So that was bad. The seven day free trial and 30 day free trial increase your, your cohort significantly. So it can work, but then also for performance marketing, it makes, that, it, it makes your window much longer. So instead of look, waiting three days or four days, you have to wait eight days or 31 days to see if your campaigns are working. So reducing the trial period is much better for performance marketing, works well for conversion, but it's bad user experience. So it's always gonna be on the company from a product and growth decision to see which one you're gonna prioritize. And it, during growth stage, in my opinion, you prioritize growth. Uh, hi, I was wondering if you also did an A-B test on, uh, on the retention. So did you see a, a difference in the retention between the, the, the two differences? There, uh, we looked at the cohorts, so we looked at the users who came in through one flow and the other flow, if there was any difference. Uh, the retention rate past month one, exactly the same, didn't change at all. The retention rate within month one, so users who signed up through this flow was a little bit uh, smaller, meaning our churn was a little bit higher. But even then, the net purchase conversion rate was significantly higher. So at the end of the day, Users did sign up. We did get more cancellations within month one, but um, the uplift to churn was maybe less than 10%, while the uplift to conversion rate was more than 100%. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. I'm curious to know uh, more about uh, how you uh, started working with the publishers and then how you scaled that, because um, it seems like you, you mentioned that you work with a lot of different publishers uh, that getting access to their content. Uh, and that's one. And then the second thing, I just checked uh, the app. Uh, I checked out the app and then um, also, and then also checked, because uh, I use um, Audible. And then with the, same, um, the same content, the same author, the same, everything is the same on both, both sides. So what's like kind of the motivation for the publishers to go also with you and they don't have any exclusivity for, for the, both of those or, yeah. So, um, great question. Uh, so f I, I don't want to speak too much on behalf of the publishers because I can't um, and I don't work there so I don't know exactly what their motivation is. But um, I would guess that the reason why publishers want to work with more players like us, for example, is because a monopoly is bad for the market. So it's bad for them if they have just a single player in the market that is controlling everything. I don't know if that's the reason, um, but that makes sense to me at least. Um, also, we have very good relationships with publishers. So when we started this out, we spent about, before we launched Audiobooks, we spent about four to f six months creating a relationship with publishers. Uh, some through uh, third party, some through uh, direct conversations. And we started building these relationships. Uh, we have an office in New York who focuses strictly on this, basically. Um, and it, it took a while, but the publishers see the interesting model that we want to build. It's different than Audible, so they see that there's a lot of benefits there. One of the things that Audible does is, uh, and I don't want to take away from what they do, I think they have a great product and it's fine, um, but one of the things that they do is they charge 15 bucks for every book, right? Each book costs the same price, when that's not real. In reality, no two books are the same. Um, so there's no reason why they should be priced the same way. Uh, and I understand that concept, but this means that on majority of your books, you might be overpaying. It comes down to what you're reading and what your selection is. So what we wanted to create was something that was much more 
similar to a uh, Costco of audiobooks rather than an Audible. Uh, the reason is you come in, you pay your membership. The new plan now is $29.99 a year, so it's a very cheap membership. And then we gamified it through coins, so you use different coins, or you use coins to unlock the titles that you want to unlock. You have access to 5,000 titles unlimitedly that you can just listen to as much as you want. But if the titles that you want aren't in those 5,000, then you have to unlock them, and you unlock them with coins. On average, uh, and I can say, I can speak on my library, like the books that I want to listen to, like Ready Player One and uh, The Hobbit and my, some of my favorite books, uh, I spend maybe 700 coins to 900 coins on these books, which depending on the bundle I buy averages it out to about $8, so instead of 15 uh, to listen to a book. So to me, this model makes sense. It comes down to what your habit and your listening habit is. This is why we never really wanted to compete with Audible on, on that front. Um, but it really took a while for us to develop these relationships. Uh, we believe that every publisher should be working with us. Um, we're also developing our own originals as well, which is something very uh, near and dear to us. Um, we believe that great stories should be told, um, both from the nonfiction and the fiction perspective. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it was a lot of growth working with publishers. The reason why they decided to work with us as well, I, I think it's because it's also a different avenue. There are things that are exclusive. So Audible does have some exclusives and we also have some exclusives, but um, these are like less than 1% of the entire catalog. Thank you guys. <laughs>